the, the task that Arun and, and others asked me to talk about, and I really want to build on, the, on what you've already heard about. Arun's discussed energy. You know, Chris gave you a really nice overview of climate and where we are. And so I'm not going to talk about climate, um, but they asked me to speak a bit about uh, emissions trajectory, sort of where are we in, in, in different greenhouse gas budgets and how do we know. And so I'll talk a bit about carbon dioxide, a bit about, uh, about methane, as, as Chris mentioned, and talk a little bit about solutions and give you some examples um, from our work as well. Um, first, just to build on the climate components, um, uh, you know, one of the, I guess if you remember one thing from my talk today, it's to, to get involved early. And I, I, I'm going to suggest that you, you know, find, some, some, find a professor or some topics that interest you um, and reach out to those professors you know, as, as soon as you can in your stay. And you have a lot to contribute. We need your input. And I think we have some things to, to provide for you that can help you learn and increase your skill set while, while you're here at Stanford, too. So this is an initiative that we started this year, Andrew Ring. Um, uh, in computer science is really the, the computer science brains behind this, but we have, it's an artificial intelligence boot camp for climate, where we work with undergraduates, graduate students, and postdocs, kind of linking the computer sciences up with the earth sciences and other, other areas, energy, engineering, and such. So this is an example of the kind of thing that goes on here at Stanford. This is a concentrated semester where the undergraduates spend 30 or 40 hours a week um, working on scientific questions that, uh, that we put forth. One of them is a a global analysis of methane emissions that, that I'm helping to organize. Um, and that's just one example. So get involved. That's the, the one thing I want you to remember. OK, the Global Carbon Project, briefly. Well, who are we? What do we do? Um, we're a group of hundreds of scientists. And we uh, publish for carbon dioxide an annual budget of sources and sinks for, for carbon dioxide from natural sources, because you have to understand the natural system to understand the perturbation to that system through human activity. So we study ocean. Uh, ocean carbon cycling, land-based carbon cycling, like Chris mentioned, forests, grasslands, soils, um, industrial activity uh, for uh, uh, power plants, vehicles, um, methane emissions uh, from, from heating our homes and pipelines that leak and things like that. So we put these things together into budgets um, that, that combine sort of top-down approaches, satellites, aircraft, tall towers, with bottom-up approaches, inventories, chamber-based measurements, you know, counting valves, and pieces of infrastructure and estimating things this way, and then ask where do they match? And that's sort of that's the that's sort of the basic philosophy is to try and to try and approach these budget budgets from two directions and see where, if any, discrepancies there are. So we do that for carbon dioxide yearly, uh, methane. We're, we've just submitted our new methane budget um, this month. Uh, we'll have our first ever nitrous oxide budget out late this year or early next year. And then we work on some other things, urban emissions, and then the sort of the broad space of cumulative emissions and negative emissions. So how big is the atmospheric budget for greenhouse gases? You know, when we talk about stabilizing the Earth's temperature at 2 degrees C or 1.5 or 2.5, you know, how, how big is that bucket? How much space do we have left? And for those of you who are socially inclined, who gets to fill the rest of the bucket? You know, and based on what criteria, per capita emissions, historical emissions, you know, issues of equity, social justice, hi historical factors, things like that. So we work, um, we work more on sort of the, the physics, the chemistry, um, the earth sciences of those budgets. But we're very, very interested in, in helping people uh, you know, make ethical, use this information to make ethical decisions. So we'll talk a little bit about cumulative emissions as well. So here's where we are from. Uh, uh, so we released this at the last COP, uh, the Conference of the Parties. In December, we'll release our next budget in Santiago uh, in the current COP in December. So last year. Um, 2018, we had about 30, 37 billion tons of carbon dioxide from fossil fuel emissions and cement production. We had about another four or five billion tons from deforestation. So for carbon dioxide alone, the annual budget is now over 40 billion, billion tons a year. I think Chris presented a cumulative budget for you that suggested we got about 500, 500 billion tons of, of carbon dioxide emissions left to stabilize with for two degrees C. So you, you, know, you don't have to have a PhD in math to know that's 10, 12 years. Um, at current rates. Now, there's some, some, some wiggle room in that. Depends how confident you want to be. If you want to be 90% certain you'll stay below the budget, the budget's got to be a little bit lower. The bathtub's a little lower. If you're you know, willing to take a little more risk, the bathtub's a little bit bigger. Um, but you know, anyway, you, we, we are not, as yet, decreasing global carbon dioxide emissions. And I want to talk about why that is. There are signs of progress, like you know, 2014 to 2016 was the first period in time when emissions stabilized and the global economy grew. And that's um, really, really quite important, because in the past, the only time emissions have dropped is when there has been global economic downturn. So we're seeing hints of progress, but they're not fast enough. Let me move ahead. 
Uh, these are current emissions now by year, 1960 to 2018, billion tons of, of carbon dioxide. Um, India here, growing rapidly, Europe, US, China, and then all the rest of the world combined. So you see, um, you know, uh, 20, 30 years ago, the European Union and the US were equivalent in terms of CO2 reductions. Europe, Europe has made more progress than we have in reducing our emissions. India is growing rapidly. Their per capita emissions are still four or five times less than ours in the United States. You've got 300 million people in India who don't have access to reliable electricity. Those people, for first and foremost interests, need more energy, not less. So we need to provide it to them, like, like Arun uh, talked about. And then China was responsible for much of the growth in the sort of the 2000 decades, and now their per capita emissions are about the same as Europe's, but still only about half of ours. All right, so you know, we've, got, we've got declining emissions modestly in the U.S., uh, even more so in Europe, but not anywhere close enough to, to make up for the other people around the world who, who still use less energy than we do. Um, so where, does the, where do these emissions go? Well, on the left are the sources. About 90%, uh, close to 90% of the imbalance in the global carbon cycle comes from fossil fuel emissions, about 10 12% from, from deforestation and land use. Okay, and then about, only about half that carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere. The rest of it's going back into oceans or back into land, regrowing forests, um, uh, stimulation effects, fertilization, and things like that. So really, the, the, the atmospheric concentration could be rising uh, twice as fast as it is for the same level of emissions. So one thing we study in my group, along with kinds of energy things I'll talk about today, is to what extent will forests continue to provide this benefit? Because if you, if you sort of dial down or if that benefit slows, then emissions are going to, atmospheric concentrations will rise for the same level of emissions. So that's the kind of a, an example of a biological feedback uh, with the energy system, that the kinds of things that people here at Stanford and elsewhere work on. All right, so we spend a lot of time thinking, where does the carbon come from? Where does it go? And how much of it stays in the atmosphere? Okay, so the good news, renewables are exploding. And you've already heard about this a little bit. So here's 14% you know, growth for the, last, for the last five years or so, all right? Uh, driven by technology, driven you know, increase, uh, increasingly in the US simply by price, two, two and a half cents a kilowatt hour wholesale prices. Um, so that's fantastic, you know, the, the biggest sign of hope. Energy efficiency increases, the greatest benefit we've had um, for reducing emissions. But what else is happening at the same time? Look at natural gas use, look at oil use. A little bit of, uh, of a decrease in coal uh, coal use and coal production. So at the same time, we're, we're adding renewables at record levels. Fossil fuels are still going up. All right, so some of that, some of this and some of this is replacing some of this. But that's not all that's going on. Primarily what's going on is that global energy use is increasing. So here's a graph of uh, gross domestic product, a gross world product at the top going back to 1990. You see that that has risen faster than CO2 emissions or energy, so our global economy is becoming more efficient. That's good. What's not happening, and maybe the biggest surprise to me when I see a figure like this, look at 1990 and look at the CO2 emissions per unit of energy. They are the same today as they were almost 30 years ago, right? So that means that for all this progress, and I'm serious, this is a fantastic progress in renewables, we're still sort of building fossil fuel in infrastructure and emitting that fossil fuel infrastructure sort of in the same proportion. So in, on average, globally, we're not taking fossil fuel plants offline when we produce you know, a new windmill or a new solar farm. We're adding it to our, our energy infrastructure. So we need to think about how to take those facilities offline. Ideally, as Chris said, not in a way that takes power plants out of the cycle before their lifetimes are up. We need to figure out ways to decarbonize our transportation sector, which is more different than electricity. But this is fundamentally what's changing, and because that's not changing and energy use is still going up, emissions are still rising. All right, now there are different ways, let's think a little bit now about trajectories, different ways you know, to think about how we might stabilize at one and a half or, or two degrees C. And these are just very much cartoonish. Glenn Peters from, the, uh, from Norway, Cicero and the GCP um, put this together a few years ago. So you could imagine, all right, we're gonna, we're gonna bluster along at 40 billion tons a year and then Whammo, we're just going to stop emitting carbon dioxide completely. You know, and you get this sort of scenario at the top. Or you can say, let's take a really aggressive mitigation scenario, three, four billion tons a year, scale that back down, keep within our budget. Or, since we don't appear to be willing to do either of those things, maybe we 
reduce emissions, go beyond what that budget for one and a half or two C would allow, and then we invoke uh, voodoo or technology or both to remove those that move that carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And it's not strictly voodoo. There are technologies underway that might potentially allow us to do this using trees, using industrial processes. We'll just talk about them briefly. But this is going to be expensive. All right, this is like a drop of ink. You know, you keep the keep the emissions from going into the atmosphere. It's like blotting a drop of ink. You let that ink go into a bucket of water, and you have to pull that ink back out of that water. You're going to do a lot more work to extract that ink from a bucket of water than from catching it on your handkerchief. All right, so that's what we're facing if we wait for this kind of, uh, this kind of scenario. Well, what can we do? Um, there are different approaches. So here's a typical fossil fuel plant. Results in carbon dioxide or carbon being removed from the ground, mined, burned, released to the atmosphere. We could make that carbon neutral by capturing the carbon dioxide, putting it back underground. We can also make it carbon neutral by using plants as the energy source instead of a fossil fuel source, burning that, um, and then uh, that goes back into the plants. All right, but the only way to go negative is to say, for instance, use plants to take the carbon dioxide out of the air, burn them or use them for energy, and then pump that carbon dioxide underground. So in that sense, you're actually going negative from there to there, or to use an industrial process to go from atmospheric carbon dioxide to a plant to underground. So that's sort of the world of negative emissions. There's a lot of work that's being done um, in that area, too. Um, just to give you an example, and I'll move on to methane, uh, it's a somewhat complicated figure, but these are examples of different negative emissions technologies. So biomass energy with carbon capture and storage in the top left is one. Uh, direct air capture, these industrial processes, growing trees where they weren't uh, to put carbon back on the landscape or in soils or, or restoring forest systems. Uh, crushing up uh, particular rocks that then are oxidized, uh, um, I'm sorry, then weathered uh, in place that remove that carbon dioxide and then reburying those, those, uh, those things. So each of these have, have a different land footprint, a different cost, um, a different water requirement. So when, when we think about managing the, the world at a billion ton carbon scale, we've got to think about these other things too. So here is, uh, you know, uh, biomass uh, with energy capture produces energy. If we want to use a, an industrial process to remove CO2 from the air that doesn't use plants, we've got to supply the energy um, to do that. Biomass energy has a large water footprint, a large land footprint. You know, you're talking about a billion, billion acres of land, potentially, to do this at the billion ton scale. So anyway, work like this, this is work led by Pete Smith that we did a couple of years ago, but work like this is to help us to try and understand not just the carbon cycle components to this work, but the interactions that affect other things we value um, in the world around us. And then lastly, this is a paper that, uh, that I led that came out this year. Uh, people haven't talked about removing methane from the atmosphere. So methane's harder because it's less abundant in the air, but it's also more potent, more powerful as a greenhouse gas than CO2. So we're working on, just starting to, and have proposed using particular minerals that might allow us to, to sort of to, to remove that, uh, that methane from the atmosphere. Not easy, uh, will be expensive. But the advantage here compared to CO2 is this, a, this is a downhill reaction thermodynamically. So in principle, it doesn't require energy to, to do that. So that's one thing that my lab's working on. Let me switch to methane just very quickly. Um, here's, a, here's a sample of the global methane budget. Now, the, you know, the elephant is, is carbon dioxide, but methane is the second most important greenhouse gas that we've perturbed. And we have perturbed the global methane cycle far more than we perturbed the global CO2 cycle. So more than half of methane emissions today are human sourced from agriculture and from industrial activity, more than half. So we've more than doubled the natural cycle. So here are fossil fuel production there. Agriculture, primarily cattle and rice farming. And then here are natural sources, wetlands, uh, natural geologic seeps and such. So our group works on you know, wetland emissions and then also particularly on the fossil fuel uh, use and production side. Um, here, this is just a, a, a figure that shows you where methane is emitted around the world. The size of the pie is the amount. So primarily in the tropics, where you see green, those are natural sources. Blue and gray are the agricultural and fossil fuel sources. So in the tropics, we have most emissions, uh, primarily or mostly natural, not exclusively. Temperate systems, a little smaller, primarily industrially and agriculturally based. And through inventories and such, we can you know, ascribe in that bottom-up approach that I mentioned you know, where these sources are coming from, you know, the number of cattle, where rice is produced, 
uh, where fires occur through natural emissions and from human sources of fire, uh, fossil fuel infrastructure, natural wetlands, and things like that. So this is how we kind of compile some, compile some of this information, sort of integrate it, and then look at these sources and what the atmosphere tells us about uh, where methane is being emitted. So if, you wanna, if you're concerned about permafrost methane runaway, you, you can expect to see that up in the north. If you go back to this, this previous slide, you know, there isn't a lot of methane emissions relative to, to the global cycle in the far north. So we keep an eye on that sort of thing um, to look for early, early signs of potential runaway methane production. Okay, let me finish just with a couple examples from, from some things we do. Uh, in my group, uh, I'm very interested in, in reducing methane emissions, greenhouse gases from energy infrastructure. So we fly helicopters, we drive cars, we put instruments on top of skyscrapers and take measurements through time to try and attribute sources over cities and different places. I'll give you just a couple of examples. Here's one that was published a couple years ago. We flew 8,000 uh, oil and gas wells randomly across the United States in a helicopter. This is like a restaurant inspection. You show up unannounced uh, and you film it with an infrared camera, see who leaks, who doesn't, and what correlates with those leaks, uh, how big the site is, how old it is, who's running it, what the policy and regulatory framework and inspection framework is for that site. Um, so here's an example. Um, let's see if I can make a video work. So this is using an infrared camera. These, these emissions are invisible to the naked eye. So you're in your helicopter, you film it. So there's a leak from, a, from the top of a tank. Now that's not normal, all right? What's normal is to show up and see nothing at all, right? But, but occasionally, 1%, 5%, even 10% of the sites, depending on where you are in the United States, this is what we see. So we try and you know, collect this information and then feed that information back to the companies who are working there. And, and also uh, you know, try and use data to, to make the system cleaner. So another example, city streets. Uh, my group with colleagues in, in Boston, Nathan Phillips and others, did the first studies of publicly available data in cities. We put new analyzers in, in cars, laser-based instruments, and drove every block of cities. So I'm, I may be, I guess, I think I'm likely to say, you know, I'm the only person who's driven every block in the city of Boston. Um, some, of the, some of those blocks many times as you're, as you're, you know, as you're filling out the grid, if you will. Um, so you know, occasionally when we find a large source, it's like fishing, you know, you're trolling and then once in a while, ping, your analyzer goes off and you get a spike. Um, then when that spike, when that ping is big, we can hop out of the car, sample the gas and look and see whether it's sewer gas or a fossil fuel based um, gas and attribute the source to that loss. So when we do that, we see a map like this. This is Boston. Now, Boston's not everywhere in the United States. Boston's old. There are pipelines here still that are 100 years old, right? Red road miles driven. Yellow are, are, are spikes, leaks. Number one predictor of, a, of a, a, a leak in an old city like Boston is old infrastructure. It's not a poor neighborhood, rich neighborhood thing. It's an old neighborhood, new neighborhood thing. Um, we published this, this work. This is now about five years old, a little old, but the, you know, the mayor commented on it the next day. At that time, uh, Congressman Markey, now Senator Markey, commented on it the next year. Massachusetts passed an accelerated pipeline replacement bill based not exclusively, but partly on our work. So this allows the companies to front load expenses and be able to recover the cost of those expenses earlier to clean up that pipeline and make repairs that they would have delayed for 10, 20, or 30 years. So it speeds up that, 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 that repair and replacement of that old, old infrastructure. So in a sense, everybody wins. Uh, consumers pay about a dollar more a month, however, one thing that, that many people don't know is that you and I, consumers, pay for the gas that, that goes leaking out of, out of pipeline systems, right? So we're, already, we're actually paying for that gas um, out of these 100-year-old pipelines. So the consumers will benefit not just economically, but because the system will be, will be much safer. And we can show that by um, you know, comparing cities that have been uh, you know, cleaned up, if you will, where partnerships have have uh, you know, led to, to replacement of those pipelines over sort of a decade, decade and a half time period. So we drove Manhattan, the city still has a lot of leaks and, 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 and repairs in Manhattan are expensive for obvious reasons. But you can compare it to cities that, that have had creative partnerships for a decade or more to get rid of their emissions, Durham, North Carolina, Cincinnati, Ohio, you know, compared to say, say Manhattan. So you get uh, you know, 1 20th the number of leaks you know, 90, 95% reduction in leak densities for these programs. So they do work. Um, they're, helping, they're helping reduce natural gas emissions, but the motivator isn't climate change. It doesn't matter whether you're Republican or Democrat. The motivator for people is safety. 
So these are just uh, you know, some of the justifications from a pipeline framework for doing this uh, outside of the environment. Air quality, you know, hydrocarbons catalyze ozone formation. Rare, very rare events, the natural gas system is safe, but accidents still happen and cost us money. Jobs, and we pay a couple of billion dollars a year for lost and unaccounted for gas. All right, just one example, I'll, um, I'll stop here. Uh, one thing we've been working on for the last year or so is people's homes. And surprisingly, the, the whole part of the natural gas chain that's the least studied is what happens after the utility brings natural gas to your home or building. And at that point in time, when it crosses the meter, it's no longer the utility's responsibility, it's the owner's responsibility. So we're sampling homes for water heaters, uh, stoves, furnaces, uh, uh, leaky pipes, and things like that, to try and, again, figure out what's, how much is actually being emitted. Um, and there are some, some real surprises in this that we're finding. And, and then ultimately trying to work with companies and where needed to try and re-engineer some of these appliances and, and, uh, and reduce those emissions. And, and ultimately, we're going to need uh, also to electrify our homes as we need to electrify our cars using low carbon sources. So I'm going to stop there. And I wanted to leave time for questions, and thanks for your, for your attention. <laughs> Any questions? You guys are ready for break. Got one here. So uh, Arun mentioned that it's about a 4% uh, natural gas leakage rate that makes natural gas worse than coal. Do you have an estimate as to what the leakage rate is now? Yeah, a lot of people would say it's closer to two and a half or three percent, um, and that's that's in the electricity sector. I think it's fair to say that the EPA would tell you it's about one and a half percent, one point six, one point eight percent. I think there's pretty much nobody um, in the research community who thinks that number is correct. So we're up, you know, we're up into the two, we're into the low twos at least. So um, there are other reasons to support a transition from coal to natural gas. Right, the number one source of well, two largest sources of, of air pollution deaths in this country, coal-fired power plants um, and cars. All right, so you get rid of, uh, take coal plants offline and replace them with natural gas or especially renewables, and we improve air quality. You know, there's no mercury emitted from natural gas and especially from solar and wind and things like that. So there are other reasons for doing it. But the numbers, we have some work to do to bring the numbers down. And ultimately, we're going to need to, if we're going to keep burning and using natural gas, we need to store that pollution underground or switch to, to, to no carbon sources. Mm -hmm. uh, you had showed a graph that um, had that the CO2 emissions um, per energy had been about the same over several decades. Why hasn't the um, increase in use of renewable energy sort of reduced that number? Yeah, it's a great, it's a really fascinating, uh, it's a really fascinating issue. And, and it has in places. That's what it has in the United States. Um, it has in Europe, where, where as particularly old power plants have been taken offline. So the, probably the, num the biggest trend in energy, um, as you all know, in the United States has been a 40 to 50 percent uh, drop in coal-fired coal uh, electricity over the last uh, you know, decade or two in this country. I mean, that's an amazing change. But it takes a long time to do that, right? You, you spend a billion dollars on a power plant, you don't want to take that plant offline in year 15 instead of year 30, right? So there's a delay in taking those power plants offline. So that's part of the story. Um, in the US, we're, we're using more fuel for, our, you know, for, for driving, especially for air travel and things like that. And right now, there's really no zero carbon um, commercially viable means to, to get rid of transportation and air traffic in particular. But elsewhere around the world, it's something else. You know, if you're in India, you don't have natural gas resources to speak of. So India is building a lot of new coal plants. They, they're using, you know, building a lot of, 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 of wind and solar too, solar in particular. So the, the real answer is that in play, other places around the world, we're building new fossil fuel infrastructure for people who need electricity and because of, you know, geopolitical and other reasons too. So most of the renewables coming online around the world are not taking fossil fuel infrastructure offline. They're adding new energy infrastructure into the mix. There's one in the back. So uh, in many of the, in most of the talks, we talk about a budget of, uh, see, with the given budget, we have around 15 to 20 years. Uh, 
to stay under the 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius. Yeah, not 1.5. Right. So two, uh, maybe. Given the given the trend that we have observed over the past years, where um, the greenhouse gas emission has been increasing, is there any possibility of actually meeting those 15 to 20 year windows, or what what do they mean in that scenario, in in realistic terms? Yeah, the 1.5 degree budget is sort of the aspirational target of the, the Paris Agreement, and maybe we'll finish, uh, maybe we'll finish with this question unless there's a quick follow-up. Um, you know, the 1.5 degree target is the aspirational um, goal of the Paris Accord. Uh, you know, is is it still possible to reach that target? You know, absolutely, it is. Is it likely we're going to reach that target? I mean, I'll I'll be honest. Uh, no, you know, it's not likely that we're going to reach that target. Short of you know, really. Uh, well, if we were to reach that target, the most likely way we would do it would be to implement massive uh, 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 you know, carbon dioxide and greenhouse gas removal from the atmosphere, in sort of a negative emissions approach. Um, two degrees C, a little, little more possible. We're not on track right now. We're not even on track right now to meet the Paris Accord agreements, which only got us to about 2.7 degrees, approximately. Um, so globally, we're not uh, reaching that. Is two degrees still possible? Yes, it is. Um, is it? You know, odds on favor to make it, not the way we're going now. But you can't, you know, you can't give up. It's all of our job to, you know, to, to change that trajectory. That's what we try and do in the Global Carbon Project, what other, other people and groups here at Stanford and elsewhere are trying to do. But, you know, I've got to be frank. I'm an optimist at heart, and I believe in what we do. And I'm going to encourage you, again, to get involved. You know, take advantage of the time, uh, you know, the people here. Bring your expertise and knowledge to help us. But, um, you, know, I, you know, I'll be honest. Right now, we're not on track to make two degrees but I it would do anything I could to help us get there. Are we good? All right, thank you, everybody. Have a great time. Feel free to stop by. Mm -hmm.